We're here to listen to Alex Klinikos, who is the editor of the International Socialism Journal, um, speaking about what Marx learned from Hegel. He'll speak for about 35 minutes, and then we'll open the meeting up for questions and discussion. Uh, a, few, a few years ago, I was talking to a very distinguished and intelligent academic philosopher at the university I work in work in King's College here in London and he said to me uh, Marx is alright, Marx is acceptable but Hegel is crap and this is still very representative of the attitude of mainstream academic philosopher toward, towards Hegel that he's just, you know, this is a guy who's just talking rubbish I mean things are changing slightly, I went to uh, a conference a month ago at University College here in London, which is traditionally one of the, um, one of the main centres of academic philosophy in the English-speaking world, um, a conference on book three of Hegel's Science of Logic, The Doctrine of the Concept, which was, you know, you have to be a super nerd to go to a conference on the the book three of Hegel's Sounds of Logic, but it was quite interesting that it was taking place in this stronghold of uh, what's, what's called analytical philosophy. Anyway, despite that conference, Hegel is still very much an out, uh, outsider. And this, this is a problem in, so, in as much as you can't separate Marx and Hegel in the way in which this guy was, was trying to. Marx uh, learned from Hegel... Uh, in very important, important ways, although also quite complicated ways. And it's really that that I want to talk about uh, this afternoon. Um, first of all, who was Hegel? Hegel was born in 1770 um, in a, a one German uh, statelet. Germany was then fragmented into lots of small, small states. Um, uh, he um, uh, studied theology, um, but in the end, he became a professional academic philosopher and indeed the professor of philosopher at Berlin University at a time when Berlin, as the capital of Prussia, was becoming a major European capital with the rise of first the military and then the economic power of, of Prussia. Um, Hegel were like uh, the other young German intellectuals of his generation, was profoundly influenced by the French Revolution, uh, starting in 1789. He and his best friends at the Theological Seminary are supposed to have put up a liberty tree to the French Revolution. His friends were another major German philosopher, Schelling, and the great poet, Herdlin. So he was moving in quite refined circles. And although Hegel became more conservative in later life, he was always loyal to the French Revolution. Every 14th of July, Bastille Day, he would raise a glass. He liked a, a pint or two. He would raise a glass to the French, French Revolution. This was true more broadly of the current from which he came from, which is generally known as German classical idealism. The founder of this current, Immanuel Kant, um, as a very old man, wrote an essay in which he said the French Revolution proves that there's progress in history. So there's a politics here to, to Hegel. That politics uh, involved trying to combine two things. Combining the um, ideal of the Greek city-state, uh, European intellectuals, in the 18th and 19th centuries were enormously influenced by the literature of ancient Greece and Rome. And the city-state, the, the basic political unit of classical Greece, was seen by people like Hegel as a kind of ideal community. Here we have a small-scale state um, in which a lot of idealization going on here. Everyone has their place. The individual is integrated into a larger whole. So Hegel started off seeing the French Revolution as a kind of model, uh, as the, the, having the potential to recreate um, the ancient Greek political community. 
as time went on, partly because of what happened in the French Revolution, but in some ways more because he started reading the great British political economists, Sir James Stewart, Adam Smith, David Ricardo and so on, he realised that there was something distinctive about modernity, that it involves, I mean he doesn't use the word, but it involves the deve economic development of capitalism and the way that atomizes and divides societies. This didn't mean that he gave up on the ideal of the, um, uh, of the classical Greek political community, but he tried to link that to um, also realizing the, individual, the individualism characteristic of modern bourgeois society. You might say this is an impossible task. It, I think it was. But this was what Hegel was, was trying to do. And philosophically, he associated the French Revolution with what I'm going to call the principle of subjectivity. Um, here we begin to walk onto a boggy philosophical terrain. What I mean by that are two things. First of all, the idea of individual freedom, which is clearly very much associated with the rise of bourgeois society and with essentially bourgeois revolutions like the French, French Revolution, individual freedom in a capitalist context, um, of which Hegel was very aware. This is one of the distingu distinguishing features of him as a, as a philo philosopher. But at a second and more abstract level, there is the, I, what, what we find in particular developed by someone I've already mentioned, Kant, who carried through what he himself, Kant himself, called a Copernican revolution. Copernicus um, uh, reframed as astronomy on the assumption that rather than the sun, the earth going round the sun, the sun goes round, sorry, let me get this right, the earth goes, rather than, I can, I can never get it right, I'm a, I should never say anything about physics, um, rather than, as in ancient thought, uh, the sun going round the earth, um, in, instead the earth goes round the sun. And um, Kant saw himself carrying out a similar reversal in the sense that he argued not simply our knowledge of reality, but in a certain complicated way, reality itself is dependent on subjectivity. By subjectivity, I mean something like this. The idea of the human being as fundamentally a center of consciousness. All the buzzing thoughts and feelings and so on that go inside our heads, that consciousness and also, very importantly, our awareness of what that we're conscious, we're not simply conscious, we're aware of being conscious, we're self-conscious, that is subjectivity. And somehow the reality that we live is constructed starting from that subjectivity. So Hegel ties together these two ideas of individual freedom and of the, center, the, human, indivi the individual human center of consciousness as the point from which philosophically and in some sense in reality we construct the world. Now, this idea this philosophical idea is called, often called idealism because we're saying, I mean, in a way, it's, it's not very apt to talk about a Copernican revolution because Copernicus was kind of decentering things and saying we're not the centre of the world. Kant was saying in a, we are the centre of the world in the sense that reality is con constructed from su subjectivity, from, from consciousness. And Hegel... Um, I mean, Kant was much older than Hegel and his generation, although they overlap with each other. Hegel continues the, the classical tradition, idealist tradition started by Kant, but he develops it in a very complicated way. And I want to talk briefly about what that involves for Hegel's approach to history, because this is one of the areas that Marx uh, learnt a lot from Hegel uh, about. Um, History is at the centre of Hegel's thought in a way that is new. Um, philosophers had tended to see thought as something disembodied and eternal, something detached 
from society and its conflicts and transformations. Hegel, on the contrary, sees thought as intrinsically historical. In other words, it undergoes profound changes, and those changes can't be distinguished, separated off from the larger and itself changing social context in which they find themselves. Now, we can see how that connects with Marx, who, after all, developed his own materialist theory of history. Now, you know, if you read any uh, account of Marx's thought, you know, the difference between Marx and Hegel is Marx is a materialist and Hegel is an idealist because Hegel puts um, mind or spirit or consciousness as the dynam dynamic um, feature, feature of history. And that's true in a general sense. But when Hegel, but Hegel's idealism is, is very subtle because he doesn't think history is a kind of expression of our subjective wills and desires. On the contrary, Hegel sees history as an objective process, unfolding in a way that in all sorts of ways escapes our understanding or control as, as, in, as individuals. Um, he, Hegel calls his, history a slaughter bench. In other words, it's a, it's a place, it's a terrain where dreadful atrocities are, are, co are committed. So he doesn't, he's not an idealist in the sense of you know, thinking, I mean, I, last week I was getting really idiotic emails from one pressure group saying I should vote for the EU out of love. You know, Hegel, that wasn't the kind of idealist that Hegel, Hegel was. Um, history is a hard, imperative, objective process that imposes itself on us in all sorts of ways. History also is driven by contradiction. This is, this is one of Hegel's most important ideas. Previously, if you dis discover a contradiction in a body of thinking, that was a sign of the, the defectiveness of that body of th thinking. Contradiction was understood, Hegel says, um, as a paroxysm, in other words, a form of illness, a defect. And he says, on the contrary, contradiction is the source of all life and movement. What drives things forward are the contradictions inherent in things. And I'm going to come back to that when I talk about Hegel's method. If you want an illustration of that, another of the things that Hegel says about history is that it involves the cunning of reason. And the cunning of reason is that we do all sorts of stuff for our own petty self-interested motives. But what we discover ourselves actually doing goes well beyond our intentions and desires, and in doing that, we're, we're acting, if you like, as the agents of a larger historical process. You want an illustration of that? Boris Johnson. <laughs> Boris Johnson thought he was Winston Churchill. He thought he was going to not simply become prime minister, but kind of, you know, remake British, British society. He wrote a biography of Winston Churchill, um, you know, presenting... Um, really presenting himself as the next Winston Churchill. Uh, and then what, what happens? You know, when Churchill, uh, Boris's May 1940 comes, as it did this week, what did Boris do? He ran away. <laughs> Nevertheless, he was a hapless instrument for much larger forces that are at work in the referendum and so on and so forth. So I think Boris is an excellent example of the cunning of reason. Um, he thought, and it's particularly good because he clearly thought he was being terribly clever and cunning, but a larger, more objective cunning has seized him and destroyed him. <laughs> and who could say that he didn't, didn't deserve it um, th thoroughly? Um, Okay, I've said something about Hegel's understanding of political economy. Hegel, Hegel is a very advanced thinker when it comes to political economy. He absorbed, like Marx, a few decades later, he absorbed the research, the analyses of the political economists, and it led him to realise how fragile and unstable and conflict-driven modern society was. He saw this as a reflection of the dominance of subjectivity. Because we live in a world in modernity where individual wills and desires are so powerful, even if we don't control things, then we live in this very chaotic 
and unstable situation. But his solution wasn't revolution. His solution was the state. In a sense, Cain, um, Hegel was a sort of anticipator of Keynes, of Maynard Keynes, that a strong state is necessary to integrate and reconcile all the conflicts of, um, of modern bourgeois society. And here we see something very important about Hegel's notion of contradiction. Contradiction cancels itself, he says. In other words, contradictions are always overcome. They're resolved and reconciled in a larger unity. And what's working through all these reconciliations is a larger principle, a larger force, which is his version of the idea of subjectivity. I think I've made it clear. clear. Hegel doesn't think that individual consciousnesses are in any sense intellectually or practically in control of history. There's a larger form of subjectivity which is at work in history and is driving history. And this is what he calls the absolute, the absolute idea or the absolute spirit. Um, now, <sighs> lots of people have puzzled exactly what he means by a absolute, the absolute idea or the absolute spirit. You can say it's God, but it's not, it's not God as we know it, Jim. In other words, it's not God as a person, as a transcendent uh, being that is outside the world and lays down laws for it and creates us and all the other stuff the Christian God is supposed to do. It's an impersonal God, a God that is identical with the structure of the whole historical process. Um, that's, that's why Hegel uses these more abstract, abstract terms like absolute and, and so on. The God, God, you, can't lo you can't locate God outside the process, nor is God identified within any individual stage of the process. God is rather the, the overall structure of the process, whose meaning, whose goal is to bring us to consciousness of the way in which spirit is at work at his, at, in history. And this is the ultimate form of the cunning of reason. It's all the efforts and struggles of human consciousness, not just of individual consciousness, but different stages of historical culture. Um, it, uh, one of Hegel's greatest works, The Phenomenal Phenomenology of Spirit, is a kind of genealogy of the development of human consciousness from the Greeks and Romans onwards. It's through those gradual, painful, um, conflictual, De development of different kinds of forms of consciousness, but we ultimately come to see that the meaning of history lies in the self-realization of the absolute and that we are the, the instruments, the vehicles for the self-realization of the absolute. I know this is all slightly implausible, but it's, it's what Hegel, Hegel thinks. Um, now, this then brings me to what I think is really crucial in what Marx gets from Hegel. I mean, you can see how Mar the aspects of what Hegel says about history that Marx very much gets and takes on. You know, if you think about how he writes about Le uh, Napoleon III, the, the emperor who seizes power in France after the revolution of 1848, he's very much, you know, a victim of the cunning of reason who thinks he's dominant but is in the power of much larger forces, but, Hegel, but Marx doesn't, of course, accept the absolute and, and all that. But what Hegel is most important to Marx, and of course this is something that Engels argued a long time ago, is Hegel's method. Both, if you read Marx, particularly in the manuscripts of Capital, but you also read Lenin's philosophical notebooks, which are his notebooks on mainly Hegel's Science of Logic, his other great work, apart from the phenomenology of spirit, they're both fascinated by Hegel's method. Um, now, this is where it gets slightly more complicated. There's a big debate among German philosophers in the 1790s about what the basic principle is on which all our knowledge should be founded. There's a man called Reinhold, who is now almost completely forgotten, who poses this question. And his answer to the, que to the question is, 
what he calls the principle of consciousness. In other words, a version of Kant's idea that we construct the world from individual centers of consciousness. Now, Hegel rejects this, partly because he, following Schelling, his uh, old uh, college friend, transforms the notion of subjectivity till at the center of it is this impersonal process of the absolute. But more particularly, he thinks that philosophy is defective if it depends on anything else. Philosophy has to be self-justifying. If, knowledge, if philosophy is to be the science of science, the ultimate form of knowledge, the foundation for all other kinds of knowledge, which is what Hegel believes, you know, he wasn't a modest guy uh, at all, um, then it can't depend on anything else. It has to be self-justifying. Um, and the, the dialectic comes in really uh, as a way of understanding the proce- the dialectic in the sense of um, contradiction driving things on comes comes in in order to show what the structure of this self justification is that every particular that um, knowledge develops through introducing one category discovering the contradictions inherent in it and moving from that category to another superior cap- category, which incorporates what was true in the earlier, earlier one, but adds new content to, to it. So it's the dialectic that um, produces this process of self-justification. This is brought out at the very beginning of science, the Hegel's Science of Logic. Hegel says, if um, we can't rely on any, ex- any external presupposition, to justify philosophy, how on earth do we start? Where do we start with? And his answer is with the concept of being. Being is the simplest possible concept. There's nothing more simple than the idea that something exists. Okay, fine. But Hegel says, if you just have the idea of being, just that something is and nothing else, then it's completely empty. And this means that the category of being collapses and uh, turns into the category of nothing. Because being is the, the notion of something existing without anything, any determinate feature, it's the same as nothing. And then Hegel says, well, what we then have is the idea of the movement between being and nothing from being to nothing, and nothing back to being. And that leads to a third category, which is the notion of becoming, the movement through which things are changed by, through, crucially, the discovery of their limits. We discover the limits of being. Its lack of determination means it's the same as nothing. And that moves us on into a process of becoming. And the notion of becoming is crucial for Hegel because of his notion of reality as historical, a constant process of transformation driven by the contradictions that lie within, within things. So what we have in the science of logic is this step-by-step move from one category to another that culminates at the end of the book in the absolute idea. And Hegel argues that this whole process, uh, Mark, is a circle, represents a circular movement, that the notion of absolute idea is a much more enriched and complicated and self-conscious version of the initial simple idea of being. And through, it's through that arrival point of the absolute idea that all the previous stages in the process find their ultimate justification because they're justified as steps towards the ultimate end of the absolute idea. So this method isn't simply self-justifying or rather it's self-justifying through the way in which it describes a circle. I know this is strange stuff but it's it's The interesting things in Hegel that Marx takes from him are arrived at through this uh, 
very, um, um, what shall I say, very dodgy. Yeah, they're very dodgy. Dodgy is an important philosophical uh, concept. This very, very dodgy conception of, of, his, uh, of his method. And Len Lenin, when he reads the final chapter uh, of the, um, the Science of Logic, he says it's strange. In this chapter, Hegel is at his most idealist and his most materialist. Most idealist because we have this great self-justifying circle but within that, we have the idea of a process driven by his internal, contradi its internal contradictions. And it's that pro the idea of that process that uh, Marx and Lenin crucially take from Hegel. Okay, but in Marx, it takes a more specific form. Marx likes this idea of moving from one category to another. In the introduction to the Grundrisse, which is the first of the main manuscripts that culminate in Capital, written in 1857, he talks about the method of rising from the abstract to the concrete. Anyone who was at Joseph Chinara's meeting this morning on Capital, we discussed that a bit, that you start from the simplest and most abstract concepts, like the commodity in Capital, that's where capital starts, in order to uncover the essential structure of capitalism and then step by step you build in all the more complex features. Now this formula, rising from the abstract to the concrete, that's Hegel. That's how Hegel describes his method. You start from the abstract being and you end up with the ultimate concrete which is, um, which is the abs absolute idea. And so we see Marx taking on this method in, in capital, uh, in the way in which he constructs his theories, moving, moving from the commodity, uh, money, labor power, you know, then we get to surplus value, capital. It's a, the, 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 the account is getting more and more concrete till by volume three, we're talking about all the sort of as Marx himself says, the everyday re realities of capitalism, like financial markets, uh, rent and landed property, and so, so, so on and so forth. But they're two crucial differences. So Marx takes a lot from Hegel, but they're two crucial differences. And this is what I really want to con conclude, with, uh, conclude with. One is that Marx does not see this method as self-justifying. While Hegel insists that philosophical knowledge can have no presuppositions, Marx insists that what he's doing, the critique of political economy, has presupposes a reality existing independently of thought. So in the introduction to the Grundrisse, he says, Marx goes on about Hegel a lot in the introduction. That's because I think he's nervous. He's take, borrowing so much from Hegel, he has to show the difference between him and Hegel. So he said, Hegel fell in, into the illusion of conceiving the real as the product of thought, concentrating itself, probing its own de depths, and unfolding itself out of itself. Whereas the method of rising from the abstract to the concrete is only the way in which thought uh, appropriates the, the concrete, reproduces it as a, as a concrete in the, in the mind. And Marx goes on, thus the real subject retains its autonomous existence outside the head. Hence in the theoretical method, the subject society must always, always be kept in mind as the presupposition. So thought doesn't generate reality out of itself. Thought seeks to make sense of the structure of a rea reality that exists independently of itself. And what Marx is po partly pointing to there is, okay, how long, how long? Yeah, okay, from now, okay, uh, where's my book? Marx points to something that needs, can be shown in detail, that Hegel carries out a kind of confidence trick in this movement from the most abstract category to, of being to all the other categories, what he does is surreptitiously, surreptitiously introduce all the complexity and diversity of, of reality as if somehow they could be derived from the concept of being itself. I mean, this is the most idealist idea. The fact 
the idea that packed into this category of being is all the diversity of the world. That's why Hegel needs the circular, the circular method, because the, the, the culmination point of the system in the absolute idea justifies and explains all the concrete variety that has been su supposedly uh, dug out of the category of being. But in fact, all that concrete variety has to be added on to the abstract dialectic that Hegel, Hegel for, formulates. So, and this then leads to the other crucial di difference, which is Marx's method in Capital does not mark a circle. It's not that one way of, th there's not a moment of reconciliation at the end of Capital. Hegel describes what happens in his dialectic as a process of internalization. That, you know, there seem to be all these things, once we get beyond being and start addressing the complexity of the world, there seem to be all these things that are unconnected with each other. But at the end, we see they're all unified in the absolute idea. This is a process of externalization. Marx, in Capital Volume 3, is very explicit. What I'm describing is a process of not internalization, but externalization. The inner unity of the relations of value relations and relations of exploitation that are created at the level of production, which Marx analyzes in Volume 1 of Capital, are broken up and dispersed. The more we take into account circulation, the more we take into account the everyday workings of the market, till we have absurd ideas like the formula for money capital, um, which is M, M prime. In other words, the idea that money can somehow, out of itself, generate more, more money. And this, this process of externalization um, reflects the way the workings of capital, this is Marx's theory of fetishism. There's nothing like this in Hegel. The workings of capitalism encourage us to accept capitalism as a fragmented and, and meaningless, meaningless reality. Now, so there's no movement towards a reconciled, um, detached, scientific and philosophical understanding of the world at the end of the, the, the process. On the contrary, reality becomes more fragmented, more meaningless the further we go on in capital. That's one sense in which Marx doesn't end in reconciliation. But there's a more straightforward sense. Marx famously never finished capital but he told his great friend Frederick Engels how it was going to finish. He said it would finish in the class struggle and the smash up of the whole shit. And let me tell you, you don't find that in Hegel. Right, I think um, Hegel was wrong to think that the most abstract concept is being. A more abstract concept is potentiality. What is, is only a subset of what may be. And out of the potential comes the actual. Now, I think if we start with Hegel's absolute, but we leave out idealist terms like mind, idea, and spirit, just stick with absolute, I think, I think Hegel has it essentially correct. The, re the relative is that which exists by virtue of its relationships to other things. So everything we see around us is relative. The absolute is that which exists independently of any external relationship. So the absolute can, be, can only be the totality, the entire cosmos, every, everything that exists. That, that, reality, that absolute reality develops dialectically and becomes conscious of itself in us, in self-conscious organisms, which I think is the process Hegel described. He, he used idealistic terminology. We can use materialist to, terminology to, and uh, Engels said in the dialectics of nature that mankind is that vertebrate in which nature becomes conscious of itself. Um, Priscilla Alderson, I work here and I'm not sure if this question is relevant but um, there's a move for the um, research councils that fund most university research to merge and be taken over by um, a biological scientist. And um, I wonder what Hegel and Marx would say about the basis of um, 
university research uh, um, and what the kind of founding discipline might be that would um, bring them all together? No hands. Alex is going to respond to those two contributions and then hopefully somebody will have some more to say. Um, yes, um, in response to the first contribution, I think what you say is, is help, helpful in uh, pointing to the fact that the Hegel, I mean, I put it much too simplistically in saying that. Uh, uh, the absolute is Hegel's way of avoiding talking explicitly about God because it does have a specific meaning in German idealism, which is the absolute is what doesn't depend on on anything else. But I do think it is a it remains a fundamentally uh, religious concept. I mean, if we if we want to look at the origins of this this way of of th of thinking, it lies in medieval theology and then in in a much more interesting way, in the philosophy of of Spinoza in the in the 17th century, where God is de divide, defined as that which is independent of everything else, um, Spinoza makes the interesting move, of course, of equating God and nature, which in a certain way is a move in a more t materialist direction. I mean, I, I'm sure you're right that. Uh, Engels says that uh, nature becomes conscious in uh, human human beings or self self conscious. Uh, I do. Th I mean, that is very Hegelian. It's also quite pre-Darwinian. You know, here we are. You know, we're one species on one little pal planet in an absolutely, you know, in unimaginably large cosmos. You know, why should we be the point where the whole process becomes becomes self-conscious? I mean, I, I just think it accords us to too big a role. So I, you know, I mean, I think Engels is great, and and actually, I think Hegel is great. But that way of thinking of the role of human thought, I I, I I'm I'm fairly uncomfortable with. Um, yes, Hegel and the merger of research councils. I mean, Marx, of course. Um, uh, gave up trying to be an academic quite early on because he got into such political trouble. Hegel spent ages trying to get an academic job. Uh, getting to Berlin uh, came quite late for him. I'm sure he would have said philosophy is the, you know, the center point of, um, of all other uh, scientific knowledge, and it's therefore the philosophers who should unify all the different research councils and t tell them what to spend their money on and things, things like that. I mean, I think, you know, personally, I think that research funding should be done on quite a pr pluralistic basis that recognizes the particular features of individual sciences and and so on that's another problem i have with hegel you know he has a very elaborate scheme where all the individual fun sciences fit together in the philosophy of nature which is one stage of his whole dialectic and dialectical system and so on and so forth i think i think different although you can draw analogies between different sciences and how they appro approach things they have their distinct concepts, assumptions and methods and research funding should reflect that. I know that sounds quite liberal but I, it, I'm afraid it's what I think. Hi there, Stevens, um, SWD Portsmouth. Um, I'm quite new to all this. Uh, my degree was psychology, but really I should have done philosophy. Um, I'm just wondering how we take the ideas of Hegel and apply them to well, obviously everything and Marx. Where, where do we actually go from in order to smash this shit up, as Marx so eloquently put it? How, how do we use what he proposed to do it? Uh, 
Um, Marx, as he was trying to write Capital, especially in Grundrisse, and he had uh, studied the uh, Scottish political economists, wondered how, how was the method, what was the method uh, that they carried out, and he says it was quite clear. They started from the concrete. What is the most concrete in the, uh, in the work of political economy? Everyone agrees it's population. And Marx then dives in and says, well, what, what is population? It's a vacuous, meaningless statement. Again, reflecting what Alex said about Hegel's beginning. Where could you get a beginning without presuppositions? You must start from the whole. That's obvious. So everyone starts from the whole. But the whole cannot be the end point. It's always, it must be, not only for humanity, but for human, humanities, but for science. The whole is the beginning. The universe uh, in chemistry, it would be whatever the form of matter is. And then slowly, you go to the abstract, from the con concrete to the abstract. And then Marx, he says quickly, what is population without the components that make it up, without town and country? Meaningless? Yes. What is town and country? Exchange between between the peasants and the workers. Ah, so we're, we're down to exchange. Exchange implies value because they have, have, must, much, must, must, must have a rule about exchanging what? Value. And he said, look what's happening. Value and then you get price and so on. And you get to a, a, an abstract stage at which the the beginning is collapsed and, co and concrete, if you like, concentrated in, the, in an abstract like value. And look at what Engels says about value. In value is concentrated all the contradictions of capitalism in embryo, in a form that remains. Now, Hegel was constantly criticizing all philosophers before him by saying, the problem with each philosophy from all the Greeks to Kant was they took one side, one aspect, and claimed that to be reality, an abstraction. He said that cannot work. And the abstraction Hegel found was the abstraction of thought and being. And he had a, he had a, his, his constant concern was the, it must be a unity of thought and being. Nothing can, can occur without that unity. Break it, and you have, you've got a false, a false abstraction. You cannot build on anything. And therefore, Kant's, Kant's uh, collapse was, instead of the, he said, the uh, previous philosophers and scientists had uh, forced people to... Uh, to uh, adjust to the object, i.e. materialism. Study the object, not us. Study it, what it is, its, its, its richness. And he says, no, that's all been, been all wrong. Now we have, in Kant's view, we have, to we have to make the object adjust to us. He abandoned, he abandoned the objectivity of the world, so he ended up with, we cannot understand the world. And Marx, of course, finally, Marx says that in the same way that uh, the, co the uh, how did Heg Hegel, um, Hegel gave me a method, and he said, how do philosophers and everyone understand the world? He said, ref they reflect the objective world in conceptual thought. They recreate a thought world. He's quite clear in the, in the Grundritzer. He said there is no other way of doing it. You have to create, recreate an external material world into a, con, into a an, um, conceptual world. It can only exist conceptually. He spent 20 years of his life developing the concept of capital. How? By, Can you round up now, please? By, by purifying all the incredible co complexities of the external world.
to a thought structure that was absolutely coherent in, um, in, in, a, in as he said, a mental reconstruction. Those are Marx's work. So he took every single uh, great element from Hegel, and, but with difference with Hegel, Hegel did, had, was not a t lived at a time of science. Um, nature had no history, no real history. He, he, he had to pick up on God that created it, you know, the mind or a man transform. transform. So he right, had, sorry, I'm going to have no, to stop no you. No Darwin, no science, nothing. And so he said, well, uh, it has to be created by, by Marx said, by looking at, uh, at sciences, the development of science. And in that way, even today, as Lenin warned, all, all dialecticians, all Marxists, must study the latest development of science to provide that movement and, and, uh, and the development. Yeah. It's kind of a, qu a question, really, to Alex, because some people, Susan but Morse, I think, have argued that Hegel's concept, I think, of a master-slave dialectic, is this right? Basically, she argues that Hegel would have been reading here the sort of a slave, master-slave dialectic in the sense that the, the slave, supposedly unthinking, the master, kind of all-knowing, but, but the slave, by doing the work, by doing the things, actually comes to a greater consciousness, greater knowledge than, than the master. Um, she argues this, this derives, must have, Hegel must have got this idea in part at least from the reading of things like the Haitian Revolution that were going on at that, at that time, reading reports of it in newspapers and things like a massive slave revolt that was going on in, in Hegel's lifetime. And, and therefore somehow this concept of master-slave dialectic you know, it comes through to, to Marx. So it's more of a kind of a, a question really what, what Alex thought of this kind of, this kind of reading of, of Hegel and, and that. Okay, thank you. Just a quick question, really. I wondered if um, Alex or anybody else in the room uh, could say a bit more about um, Hegel's concept of the state as kind of centre of reason, if you like, because it strikes me that the, the question of the state, what it is and what it isn't, what it does and what it's capable of, is the absolutely central question of our particular times, because the state, as we know, is central to the reformist uh, project, despite 100, 150 years of some elements of reformism capturing bits of the state and the state taking over them. Despite all that, this idea that somehow the state is intrinsically valuable, that we can capture it and use it for our own good, uh, persists. So I, I just wondered uh, whether people could say something about that and whether we can blame Hegel for that or not. Sorry, it's, it's my fault for talking about Hegel. Um, okay, first of all, on the question of method, I don't think, I mean, I think it's a good injunction to study the latest sounds. I can't say that I'm, I do that a massive amount, but my impression is that scientists don't start with the whole, the cosmos or whatever. They start with specific problems. You know, Einstein gets to the special theory of relativity because he's trying to resolve certain well-known anomalies in the theory of light and, and matter. Darwin is addressing, I mean, it's a big question, but it's a specific question. How do we explain all the diversity of, of life on, on, the, on the Earth? Um, Marx himself, in Capital, he's addressing a specific problem. How can I reconcile the labor of theory of value, which is kind of perfected in a certain way by David Ricardo, with all the complexities of a capitalist economy, uh, a capitalist economy which doesn't seem to behave according to the labor theory of value? So I think scientists start with quite specific problems. And in the case of Marx, I think that the whole process of capital is a process of, of constructing what he calls the concrete in thought, the totality of capitalism. 
uh, he calls it a rich totality of many determinations and relations. The movement, the movement from abstract to the concrete is the process of, of constructing that whole. But what he begins with um, is the commodity, which he says is the economic cell form of cap the capitalist economy. In other words, it's the kind of most basic unit and through starting from that, we can then begin to, to construct, in thought, capitalism as a totality. But so I think, certainly in the case of, so I think one, scientists start with problems, and two, the, the totality in Marx is the product of Marx's process of analysis. That's number one. Number two, um, Christian's question about the class struggle in, in Hegel. Um, yeah, I mean, Hegel has a good... I mean, yeah, I mean, th th there is this brilliant analysis of the dialectic of master and slave in the, um, in the phenomenology of spirit, uh, which Marx... Uh, sorry, Freudian slip, Hegelian slip, which Hegel wrote um, in 1805, just as Napoleon's armies were crushing... He finished it just as Napoleon's army was crushing the Prussian army, uh, quite close to where Hegel was writing. Um, uh, he, he develops that dialectic there, and I think... It's, it's clear that Hegel understood about the class struggle. You, you can find that in a much more accessible form in the, um, the philosophy of right, his political philosophy, which he gave as lectures. And the individual lectures uh, reflect uh, Hegel sort of taking into account all sorts of things like the Industrial Revolution, workers' struggles in Britain, you know, all, so, all sorts of things, things like that. Um, I don't know whether Susan Buck Morse is right. There's a very good discussion of Hegel and political economy that goes into all these questions in Lucia Pradella's book called Globalization and the Critique of Political Economy, uh, which is coming out in paperback soon. So you can go into it there. The, so Hegel is well aware of the class, class struggle and the kind of danger it poses for the coherence of modern society. And this is related to his critique of the French Revolution. Because Hegel champions the French Revolution, he sees it as a real attempt to translate reason in, into reality, but he's also critical of it. And this relates to Lee's question about the state. He criticizes the Jacobins because he said, remember that Hegel's mo initial motivating ideal was restoring the ancient Greek political community, the city-state. That was true of the Jacobins as well. They were particularly influenced by Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who offers a kind of updated, I mean, this is a gross oversimplification, but anyway, who offered an updated version of the ideal of the ancient Greek, Greek polis, um, the ancient Greek, Greek city-state. City but Hegel says the problem with the Jacobins was that they could just... Um, um, the, the, they thought the ancient, uh, the, the, the a political community could be recreated essentially through legislation, through passing laws and enforcing them. Uh, and there are all sorts of ways in which the concrete reality of French society resisted that legislation. The Jacobins just saw this as uh, reaction and treason and sought to crush it. And Hegel, it's a very brilliant passage where he argues that the terror, the, the mass executions, the decapitations and so on, which of course devoured the Jacobin leaders themselves, Danton, Robespierre, Saint-Just, etc., flowed from this logic of trying to impose by force a political community. And therefore, his notion of the state was something that, while it would um, have a rationality that goes beyond the interests of the different sections of society, indeed, Hegel bigs up the state, he says the state is God on earth, um, uh, God in the sense of the absolute, he sees it as somehow integrating and reconciling all the differences of class society. Now, his concrete proposals there are, you know, reflect the influence of the hangovers of the Middle Ages in, uh, in German society at the beginning of the 19th century. 
He wants to restore the kind of corporations that existed in the Middle Ages to kind of reconcile worker and boss and so on, which are just utopian, utopian fantasies and so on. But it's certainly the idea of a strong state as kind of managing the contradictions of capitalist society. <coughs> I think Hegel is the first to articulate the idea, and that's why I think, in a certain sense, he's an, uh, he anticipates Keynes in, 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 in particular. I think I'll stop there, just see if there are any more questions. I will respond to your question, but at the end. Uh, this isn't very coherent, but I, I was just musing about um, how things moved on from Marx to, to Lenin and the idea that um, once you've understood that class struggle is the motor for, for change, then class struggle itself, of course, is contradictory. And um, assuming that out of the, a sense and awareness of those contradictions, Lenin developed um, his understanding of the need for the party and so on and so forth. But then, of course, we also know that the party then gets pulled in all sorts of different directions at different times and so on and so forth. And I was wondering if you could say something about that which might help us in the present situation, which is incredibly complex. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Okay, I'll ask Alex to come back and sum up the whole meeting for us. Okay, well, thanks, thanks a lot. Um, lots, lots of good questions, quite, quite big, big ones. I mean, in terms, beginning to answer your question, um, Ma Marx makes Hegel usable politically in the sense Hegel has a number of absolutely fantastic insights, some at a very abstract level, some in a very, very concrete way. Um, but because they're located in this very complex philosophical system that doesn't really seek, um, seek change, um, they're not politically usable. Uh, at this conference I was at, someone uh, quoted a passage which I'd forgotten about, but which is a really great one, where Hegel's, well, problematic, Hegel says, the idea of the good has already been realized. We just don't know it. In other words, we think that the world is terribly unjust and all sorts of bad things are happening and so, so on. But that's because we don't understand how reason is at work in the world and reconciliation is being achieved. We have this illusion that it hasn't been achieved uh, and that's how we live today, day to day as human beings but if we were philosophers, we would understand that the good is already realized. Now, the implication of that is passivity. What knowledge does is to reconcile ourselves to the, to the world. For all Hegel's greatness, that's ultimately a conservative position. Marx, by contrast, says the world is utterly un unreconciled. The good hasn't been realized. On the contrary, we live in a world of exploitation, war, imperialism, etc., etc., and that's why we need to smash up the existing, existing state, of, state of affairs. Now, you know, more concretely, well, we're talking, of, talking about what that means throughout Marxism, but it means, in particular, understanding the agency of the working class as the force that has the capacity to transform society, but also recognizing the importance of organization. Organization at the most basic level, because workers need organization to achieve anything, but ultimately political organization, which brings me to the, the, um, the, final, uh, the final question. Um, because organization isn't just a matter, I mean, it's very, no, don't, I don't want to say anything that seems Dis dismissive of what we do day by day. Organization, crucially, involves people working together to help build strikes, to sell socialist worker, to you know, help organize the convoy to Calais, all those very practical things. But the, the point is that all those different activities are knitted together through a strategy, a strategy that we arrive at through discussion within the, within the organization. But the apparently subtle forms of thought that um, we've been discussing in, the, in, this, in this session are relevant to those practical tasks. What, you know, we think the world's in turmoil, 
what we're experiencing is nothing to what the international working class movement experienced in August 1914 when the First World War broke out, leading to the slaughter that, you know, we're celebrating this wonderful day of British patriotism when the officers uh, sent 20,000 men to die before the German machine guns, uh, and in which the international working class movement shattered. Um, what does Lenin do when that happens? Um, he goes off to the library in Bern and reads Hegel's Sounds of Logic. And the Bolsheviks say, uh, send a delegation to him and they say, what the hell are you doing, Lenin? You're le reading Hegel, you know, when the world's falling apart. But reading Hegel helps and strengthening his understanding of the method that you need to grasp all those complexities, um, you can see that informing Lenin's writings. He, his most immediate political polemical texts, as well as the the great theoretical contributions around the national question, imperialism, his grasp of what happens when the February Revolution breaks out in Russia in 1917, all of that is read by the, uh, the, the deeper intellectual understanding that he gets from reading Hegel. Um, you know, what that means, and we should continue to do this, not in the sense necessarily of going off and reading Hegel, um, I'm not going to be like Joseph Chinar in the early meeting and demand that people read the three volumes that, or the, you know, the three books of Hegel's Science of Logic. I think it is helpful in understanding the present to read Marx, to read Capital, because, as I said, it's in Marx that Hegel becomes politically usable and politically operative because, you know, when it comes to, of course, the thing that we're all obsessed with, what on earth is the meaning of Brexit uh, now that the referendum has taken place? That method, rising from the abstract to the concrete, identifying the more fundamental features of the situation, building in the complexity step by step, that's actually very necessary in, in intellectually arming ourselves to dealing with this, this, this situation. But really, you know, what that means in more concrete terms, that's what we're going to be talking about all, all, all weekend, and I'll personally be saying a bit about it um, tomorrow, tomorrow evening. But um, we shouldn't think these kinds of sessions on Hegel or on Capital and so on are somehow separate from our everyday practice. There's an organic connection between the more abstract discussions and reading and what we do as effective revolutionaries.